we can be drawn into your presence. We thank you. And we pray also, God, that uh, by your word, we would be drawn into not only your presence, but into uh, an action, uh, an action based on your will. And so guide us, O God, by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Revelation uh, 22, uh, we'll read verses 1 through 5. This is all part of, of the, the vision, the picture that, that uh, John is given. And towards the end, we get to this in Revelation 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing, down from, the, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will, let, they will reign forever and ever. The word of the Lord. The river and the tree, in some ways they appear to be opposites. Um, for one, the river begins quite literally all over the place, right? I mean, think about the Skeena headwaters, for example, uh, tiny springs and, and distant lakes and melting glaciers. They, they all kind of contribute to this babble and rush of water. And gradually, other streams and other tributaries and, and whole rivers make their contribution uh, so that we have here in Terrace what we call the, the mighty Skeena River. But we realize, right, that, that many streams have, have gr gathered and, and made the, the Skeena what it is. I mean, think, you know, of, you know, I became a tributary because being a river was too mainstream. Think about what it is that, that draws into this one. So you, from the multiplicity, you have this, this one. That's the one image. Um, but think, on the other hand, of a tree which comes from a single seed, right? Uh, an acorn perhaps falls to the earth. It's tiny and it's vulnerable and um, it germinates and then it puts down roots into the soil, but then it also grows up and outwards uh, with large limbs and leaves and, and uh, it grows quickly. Um, an oak or a cedar, for example, they, they will spread uh, quite large. Um, of course, we have this about our own families and even about the church, right? If you shake your family tree, some nuts might fall out. But the dynamic is such that as we examine these two strains that are described right here in Revelation 22, they point out to us that the, the, the river flows from many into one, while the, the tree grows from one into many. And both of those dynamics are really present uh, if we want to understand the church. So the, so the church, on the one hand, is like a river, right? In Revelation, John's vision shows this, this huge throng of people from every nation and kindred and tribe and, and, and tongue, and they come together in this chorus of praise. And like a river, they, they started out in all sorts of different places, uh, but they've now brought this stream into one flow. And the image of the river reminds the church um, that, that we consist of people from the widest possible variety of backgrounds. Um, yet, we all belong to one another. We're all part of the same powerful flow. We, we go now in the same single direction. That is, diversity gives way to this unity. But at the same time, the church is also like a tree, right? This single seed, right, Jesus himself has been sown in the dark earth, and, and he's produced this amazing plant. Branches set off in all directions. Some point upwards, some reach down to the earth, some reach over the fence into the neighbor's yard. And, and looking at the eager, outstretched branches of the tree, you'd hardly know that they were all necessarily from the same stem, but they are. That is, that the unity um, generates this diversity in the tree. 
And in Revelation 22, river and trees come together as part of this extraordinary picture of the New Jerusalem. The river comes from this one single source, and the trees all bear leaves with the same healing power. And this double image really, I think, helps us understand something of what uh, Christians mean by the church, uh, the people of God, uh, the body of Christ. The church as the bride of Christ. The church as God's household. The church as uh, this motley group that gathers here once a week at 3602 Sparks Street. But what is the church for? What, what's the purpose of the church? Um, N.T. Wright in his book gives a relatively loaded, a fairly dense definition of the church, but I think it's, I think it's very helpful for us. He writes, The church is the single, multi-ethnic family promised by the Creator God to Abraham. It was brought into being through Israel's Messiah, Jesus. It was energized by God's Spirit, and it was called to bring the transformative news of God's rescuing justice to the whole creation. And it's helpful to see, even in that picture, that both the river and the tree help us in our understanding. Right? The first is that, that, that the church is like a, a single great river formed from tens of thousands of scattered tributaries. And back in the, in the days of the early Israelites, uh, that was generally a single family, right? But there was, in that time, still plenty of room for outsiders to come in, to come into that one family of Israel. Consider, consider all the stories of, of Ruth or Rahab or, or others that got conjoined into that one river. Then, in the New Testament, Jesus kind of sets a new normal, right? He, where uh, people of every race and tribe and, and culture and place, every shape and sort and size, are called and welcomed into this one people of God. And calling the church the people of God makes very clear the connection with the family of Abraham and then also the whole worldwide family of the church. You remember perhaps the song, Father Abraham. I won't sing it for you. It's got lots of ang actions and it's maybe the Christian song that never ends. Um, but make, it makes clear that connection between the, the Old and New Testament people of God, that we are all sons and daughters of Abraham. And second is, is that the, the church is then this many-branched uh, tree uh, planted by God uh, when he called Abraham. And Jesus, of course, is that single trunk, and the many branches and twigs and leaves are the countless Christians and communities all across the globe. And, and Paul, Paul calls the church the body of Christ. Right? It's the body because the church is supposed to do the work of Christ, to be the means by which that action is carried, in, carried out for the world. And that tree, which is of course rooted in the story of Israel, stands straight up in Jesus, um, is then branching out in all directions to be a means of implementing Jesus' work and, and making his achievement real in, in the whole world. Of course, this is reflected in Jesus' very own words, I'm the, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Right? Both, uh, both of these images, a the river and the tree, the vine, uh, reflect this idea of family. Yeah, but we have to be very careful. Because at one level, clearly family is very central to what the biblical Bible has to say. The, the early Christians lived as an extended family. They cared for each other like family. They called each other brother and sister, and, and they meant it. They saw themselves as, as children of the same heavenly father, they saw Jesus as their Lord and older brother. They shared uh, and they mutually belonged together in a sharing community. And so we must never forget that calling to be family. But the idea of family can sometimes take us a bit in the wrong direction too if we're not careful. Um, Corey ten Boom wrote this once, does being born into a Christian family make one a Christian? No. God has no grandchildren. The early church struggled with this, right? Did, did people coming into the church from the outside, into what was still basically a Jewish community, did they have to become Jews? Did they have to practice Jewish law? Did they, they have to have the men circumcised? 
The answer, thankfully, was a resounding no, right? God welcomed non-Jews as non-Jews, right? To, um, and it doesn't require uh, them to become Jewish. And, and further, Jews couldn't rely on their birth and their ancestry to assure that they were automatically in this renewed family which God was creating through the Messiah. That, that wasn't their birthright. And I think we've seen probably something like this before, right? Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. And it's perfectly possible, we know, for somebody to, to grow up in a Christian household and turn his or her back on its faith and its life. On the flip side, we know these wonderful stories, and some of them are our own, of those who grew up with almost no contact with the gospel or the church, but, but came to believe in uh, uh, um, full membership in a church. And so the, the tree and the river, these symbols of corporate Christian identity, challenge even our individualism. We are tempted sometimes to think of our faith as just me and Jesus, but it is so much more. Now, now don't get me wrong, each of us, of course, is called to personally respond in faith. You can hide in the shadows of the church for a while, but eventually you're going to have to decide whether this is for you or not. But we need to step back and learn again Paul's lesson about the church. Uh, that is, that a hand is no less a hand because it's part of a larger body. And the foot itself is not diminished uh, because uh, it's part of a body which also contains eyes and, and ears. In fact, hands and feet are, are most free to be themselves only when they coordinate properly with the eyes and the ears and everything else. Cutting them off, cutting them off would, uh, in an effort to make them truly and freely themselves, well, cutting them off would be truly disastrous. They'd die. Now, early Christians didn't see the church as a place of merely private spiritual agendas. Nor did they see the church as just kind of some safe haven to kind of hide from a wicked world and, and to ensure safety on this journey to an otherworldly destination. No, private spiritual growth and ultimate salvation were the byproducts of the main and central and overarching purpose for which, is, which God had called us and is calling us today. And that purpose is, is, is pretty clear in the New Testament. N.T. Wright writes it like this. Through the church, God, the Father, will announce to the wider world that he is indeed its wise, loving, and just creator. Through Jesus, he has defeated the powers that corrupt and enslave it, and by his spirit, he is at work to heal and renew it. Right up beautiful Trinitarian picture, and that in itself is mission. The church exists to announce to the world that Jesus is Lord. Its mission is to announce this good news which transforms people and whole societies. Through Jesus, God intends to put the world to rights. And those who belong to Jesus are called, uh, in the power of the Spirit, to be agents of this putting to rights purpose. Of course, that word mission uh, comes from a Latin word for send, and, uh, and we see it when Jesus says right after the resurrection, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And people who are, are called to be agents of God's healing love, uh, to put the world to rights, are also called to be people who have their own lives put to rights by that same healing love. The messengers must model the message. And, and that's why missionaries, that is all Christians, that's why missionaries are themselves defined as people who have been made whole. Now, some of us know this very well, that is, that waking up can be very rude and shocking as an experience, right? For some of us, off goes the alarm and our, our heart just thumps alive within us, right? Or we're, we're dragged out of this deep sleep to, to face a cruel light of day. Others, maybe waking up is a quiet, slow process, right? Uh, we can be kind of half asleep and half awake. 
we hit the sleep button maybe 15 times until gradually